Okay, excellent. Mark, over to you. Yep, thank you. I'll just share my screen and get the presentation up. So it, particularly useful, thank you for everybody for sharing um, what you're looking for from the session. It, it helps me know how to steer and guide this. Um, when I was writing slides and thinking about how to prepare this, I would deliberately pitch this as ask me anything on service management rather than service management 101 or, or something that was going to, going, to, going to teach people. I think that may be a session we can think about at another time, perhaps for people that are less familiar. But in this case, I didn't want it to be, this is what you know about ETIL, because I think there's a range of experience here, including some people who know it, who know it well. Um, so what I put together is a series of slides that are kind of leaping points for discussions. They're, they're, they're provocations, they're some of the things from my experience and, and observations that will lead us to some questions. What we will look to do this time is to provide some time at the end for any questions that we've not covered in terms of these slides. Um, at the end of each of these, I will pause, we'll pick up any questions that have been at that point. If I happen to have a question that's raised, which we've got covered in a future slide, then we'll kind of carry it over, but we're happy to cover those, but we will look to allow some time at the end for any questions that aren't, haven't been covered in the slide or discussion to that point. Um, I, I, when I usually start to introduce and talk about service management, I will talk about people, I will talk about processes, and I will talk about tools, and I will talk about the need for those to work together um, in, in an overall service management approach. Um, when I'm asked about people and who's involved in service management, my glib answer is, well, that's everybody. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that organizations now are so reliant on IT that everybody needs IT to be able to work, you know, to be able to access their emails, to be able to log onto a laptop, to be able to access the systems that they need, whether it be a, a bank system or, or a, a government system or a retail system, they will access those systems and they need those computers and the services that sit behind them to do their, to do their work. Um, I distinguish between, between roles. Um, there are certain terms that I use because they're, they're the way I've come to explain them. Um, but certainly I know some organizations use them in different ways. So I talk about a consumer of service. I never have really liked the use term user, but I will talk about a consumer of service who is somebody who will access that service, you know, could log on, could use it, could, 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 could facilitate it. They need it to do their work. So they consume that service typically initially within an organization and obviously could also then be outside for something that's more public and, and customer facing. Um, I then typically describe the role of customer above that, that would be the person who is the primary primary person who owns that service from a, from a receiving viewpoint within an organization. Um, they, they would be, if there was a bill, they'd be the people who'd sign the checks. Uh, that's not always the way it works in organizations with internal charging, but they would be the person that would sign an SLA. They would be the person who would help inform and provide a business view on what was required and what was not. Um, you will hear some people talk about clients or, or other phrases for that, but I, I make a distinguish, distinguish between a consumer who uses a service and a customer who is the go-to person within, within a business around that particular service. Um, from from a, a support and service viewpoint, obviously different organizations structure in different ways. Um, many organizations have a service manager or a title similar to it, uh, unlike, unlike project managers where that title is fairly consistent between organizations. A service manager I've seen called different things. Um, so, so I've seen them called service managers, I've seen them called service delivery managers, business relationship managers, and so on. There are different terms. By and large, they probably do the same thing. They will be the person that represents that service out to those consumers and customers in the business that access it. Um, there will then be a series of IT support teams that sit beneath that. Um, I, I make no apology for talking loudly and, and proudly about service desk being the most important point when, when it makes a series of commitments through an sla or to restore service by a certain time then service then phoning the service desk is the moment of truth at which that that's that commitment is met so having service desk empowered and, and knowledgeable and knowing what they need to do is very important and i wish more organizations took them seriously because in my experience they tend to be seen as slightly more of an afterthought and not as important as i feel they are um, in, in traditional service management terms, you know, you talk about incident, you talk about change, you talk about problem. Um, I talk about asset management. I'll talk about some other roles further down when we get to further processes. Um, business continuity was top of my mind when I wrote this because I'm acutely aware that many organizations are now having to turn their model on, that, on its head. So they're not working in offices, but are now thinking about how their staff are working from home and accessing things. And, and that in many respects is testing continuity plans in ways that perhaps many people hadn't envisaged. 
Um, many organizations are reliant on suppliers, um, whether that supplier be someone who's hosting a service for the organization, or whether that supplier be somebody who sits behind a second line support or third line support team to provide subject matter expertise and advice. Um, and of course, the, the delivery teams, so the teams that deliver projects that will ultimately turn into services um, in the future, the architects, the designers, and so on. You know, my view is, is that everybody who works in IT in an organization is part of delivering service in one way or another. And everybody who consumes service, which is going to be everyone in modern organizations, is a consumer of it. So when you ask me who's involved in service management, my answer is everybody. Um, from a process viewpoint, the next slide talks about more specific processes. What I've included in here is the ITIL V3 service life cycle, so the high level phases of that. So service strategy, service design, service transition, service operations. And, and, and again, I make no apology for talking about continual service improvement as a, as a mindset and an approach being very important, both within those processes and overall across service to have a cyclical approach to continue to learn lessons and, and find a way of improving. Um, what I included to remind me was, was a, a diagram that talks, was a, was a a line that shows me and reminds me that there are process roles. So in terms of the roles that I've described over there, um, some large organizations will have large teams that will manage this. It could be a big service desk. It could be, could be a change team. I've seen change teams of, of six or more in organizations where they, they've got a large number of changes going through cabs and so on. Um, then I've worked in smaller organizations where effectively the change manager is one person who will do the work full time and because of the size of the organization will combine other roles in. Could be release, could be configuration, could be asset. There are certain things that seem to go together as roles um, and others that don't. So some, some cases you'll see individual people or more than one filling those and in other cases you won't. Um, they'll be combined. In terms of process roles, no process can be done on its own. It has input and output from other processes and there will be a series of people that then need to manage steps within that process and that's what I mean by process roles. It is the roles within that process that will help get it done from initiation through to completion. Um, I would always see good practice being having an owner and a nominated owner for that process who's responsible for the, the policy, the process, how the tool is configured in terms of what they need for that process. Um, and so on. So they would be the owner of that. And if there is an issue or a problem or a suggestion on how to improve, then that process owner would be the go to person to raise that to get a consensus on how to move forward and to suggest those improvements. So I think the process owner role is very important. Um, there are then obviously a series of roles. I tend to talk about change management because it's the easiest one, I think, for, for people to, 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 to understand. Um, so there'll be somebody who raises the change, there'll be people who will review and approve the change, that there will be a change manager who will run and manage a, a change advisory board, um, there will be people who implement the change and so on. So through that there will be various process roles and those process roles can be done by one or many people in the organisation. And what you'll find is somebody who sits, for example, in a change manager role will have one or more roles in terms of their change management process. They could have a role in release. They could have a role in business continuity. So those process roles can be done by many people and one person can have many roles in many processes. And I have seen matrices and maps produced with a, with a racy approach, um, which show how those are, those are mapped together. And, and certainly that can help understand how that works in organizations. Um, before we pause for questions, I will just talk quickly about tools. So um, obviously tools are important and the, the quality and, and variety of tools now available has come on quite, quite, quite significantly. So of course, the ability for service desk to be able to take incoming phone calls is important. Um, so I do reference that. Um, you would typically have a way of logging and tracking and managing incidents, requests, problems, changes, and so on. Um, increasingly, we have the ability to do self-service where somebody can ask a question through a chat bot and all the like. Um, where they can request something and find frequently asked questions, resolve issues themselves and so on. That's certainly moved on quite significantly from, from where it was a few years ago. Um, there will be core data, so there'll be an inventory of hardware and software assets. There will be a configuration management database, linking it all together. There'll be a knowledge, data, knowledge, knowledge base that's informed by problem management and projects and then used by service desk to help, help uh, those people that dial in with issues. There'll be systems like this and teams and others to help um, change managers host virtual cabs. Um, once upon a time, I remember it all being sat around in a meeting at a certain time a week. Now it's more around virtual cabs, um, both in terms of calls and also in terms of online approval. Um, and, and obviously, 
various tools like, like monitoring and alerting and, and pulling those in when there's an issue. Um, many of those functions are pulled together into, a, into an ITSM tool. I know we talked about a couple. We, we talked about HP Service Manager and we talked about ServiceNow. I know of a number of others on the market, Remedy and so on. ServiceNow is the market leader and, and uh, it's certainly got a large market share. It was very, very disruptive when it first came in, has continued to grow and grow. Um, but I, I know those tools certainly are very important in terms of making them work. But I think getting the synergy between the people, processes and tools is one of the recipes for success in terms of service management. So I'll, I'll pause for breath and for questions at that point. And obviously you've got myself, Alim and, and John on the call um, to be able to answer those as they come up. Um, Mark, I'll, I'll ask the first question on behalf of yep. uh, Laiju. A uh, really good question from him, actually. Uh, not an easy answer, but one that I'm sure you can uh, address. So what he's asking is, what are some of the best practices that we need to uh, emphasize on a sh shared service desk? So when the, and, and you know take it as a shared service desk uh, either internally um, obviously you know in terms of providing different services mm -hmm. to partners but I'm guessing in this case it's shared service desk for multiple different clients and some best practices there uh, yeah that's I, I shared services and shared service desks are a very interesting topic um, I think the challenge there is that you want to you want to find a way of, of getting some consistency in the way that service is provided, but equally making sure that everybody who phones up feels and, and is and, and, and experiences that it's unique and tailored to them, their circumstance and the customer area that they're phoning in for. I used to describe this as making things making things vanilla, but actually they, they feel and taste like chocolate and pistachio and banana and so on ice cream. Um, so I think there's there's definitely work to be done in terms of understanding um, when a, when a call comes in, which customer that's for, and it could be that a service desk is segregated, so you've got one area that looks after a particular customer and another that looks after looks after um, another area, or it could be that actually you've got people, and I've spoken to suppliers who who cover different customers on the same on the same desk, and effectively at the start of the call they'll get a little voice in their ear to remind them what customer that is. I think if you're going to do that, you've got to have really good support for that service desk in terms of knowledge, in terms of customer insight, and in terms of training and awareness around that customer. Because be able to do that sort of mental gymnastics to say, I just took a call for customer A, and I'm now taking a call for customer B, and I need to be aware of what they're involved in means you are looking at a really good knowledge base, lots of good knowledge and information being provided to those service desk agents um, and to make sure that you've got as much online in terms of prompts and questions and so on that they can provide. Um, I know there are tools that can do much of that, um, but certainly you, you're requiring quite a bit of mental gymnastics. So I, I wouldn't underestimate training and bringing those, those service desk agents up to speed with, with who those customers are and what they need as, as being, being, being important in that space. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Laiju, does that answer your question or do you have a follow-up question? Okay, I see he's asked in chat. So let me raise you on his behalf again. But, you know, if yep. you want to, Laiju or others, if you want to also uh, come in verbally and ask a question or seek clarification, please do. But let me just ask again on his behalf. Uh, what are some of the ways we can break the silo approaches when we have a shared service desk where you have different set of clients? Um, I guess silo in terms of, I'm assuming, it yep. means you know, dedicated resources for a particular client, but where maybe you have to share knowledge and allow it, get each other to help and work and, and, you know, yep. and work sure. together. I, I, there's no substitute for talking to each other. And, and I know that sounds really basic, but ultimately service management and, and, and ITIL as good practice is nothing more than documented common sense. And, and I'll, I'll say that a number of times and probably said it on, on the two sessions previously at some point. I think the best way to break down the silos is to encourage more discussion between the team leads, between the service desk agents and so on. And that does require to do something else other than doing however many contracted hours you've got on the phone servicing that customer. It requires you to break out and recognize that you need to have conversations around, okay, what works here? What works there? what goes well, what lessons need to be learned, how we can improve. And, and I guarantee that following that discussion, you will find some common ground in terms of something that somebody says and does works well, something that somebody says they're having a problem with, and you can join those two up. So I think having those discussions facilitated, you could do that through 
either a service improvements or a service excellence program that pulls those pulls those people together. You know, it could be that that's a separate function that you want to have that would provide that that supports the service desk. Um, it could be that you do that through training, and I've seen excellent service desk training of teams that will will look to provide that in terms of, of knowledge and, and cross sharing. But there's no substitute for talking and looking to share that experience and and understand what can be done and learn from what, what the individual customer teams have found. Okay, and if I could just mention a couple of points from my experience that may help uh, guide you. Um, so shadowing. Um, so having mm -hmm. one team or one group of people shadowing another team, so working with them. So the lead is still the other team, but actually getting them to collaborate on that one incident in, or request or whatever it might be. So forcing that uh, interrelationship. So that's one. Of course, also um, a, any social type of activities, right? So it depends, right? Every situation is different, but getting uh, the team, the service desk team, you if they're working in silos or different areas, to uh, go out together or in this case where everyone has to work online having virtual events you know some people are doing virtual quiz nights for example so on a friday at a set time you may have a quiz night now again i know it's difficult i know the service desk may be 24 7 you know different scenarios different organizations but they're just some examples that may uh, may help if you want to explore that a bit more Laiju or anyone else uh, please, you know, ask uh, verbally. Just uh, uh, feel free to engage with Mark now. The shadow, the shadowing is a great call. I, I, I'm a big advocate of getting more senior IT managers um, back to the floor and listening in on service desk calls. And every time I've seen that done, they've realised what a great job service desk do and, and have spotted some improvements that they can help influence and make happen. So yeah, getting a, getting somebody from one team, maybe a team leader or team member, to shadow somebody on another and see how those calls work, something will come of that. Uh, any other questions or comments for Mark at this stage before he goes on to his next slide? Anything else anyone wants to explore? Okay, so let's move on um, and then you'll have time for Q&A still, okay? Yep. So carry on, Mark. Um, so I include this because it's something I've seen a number of organizations struggle with. Um, I, I try and I sort of divide service management in two parts fairly, fairly, fairly arbitrarily. So there is reactive elements to service management and there is proactive. What do I mean by reactive and proactive? Well, reactive will be something that reacts to an event that's happened. And that event could be something stopped working, a customer needs something. It will be effectively after the fact. Whereas proactive is something that's looking at future trends for something that's probably not happened yet and is taking action before it gets there to improve service, to make sure that something doesn't happen and so on. Um, and the challenge that, that service management faces and that IT organizations and operations face is there's a lot of work to do in the reactive side. You're going to have calls coming in the service desk, and I can only imagine how, how busy some of the service desks are taking calls from people that are trying to work from home and getting systems to work in environments that are different to the ones they're working at the moment with the parts of the world during lockdown. Um, there'll be incidents that come in and that need resolving. There'll be major incident reviews and problem reviews after those in reactive problem management. There'll be changes coming through from projects and from business as usual and support teams and suppliers that need to go through approval and CAD. There'll be releases in terms of those cycles for patching and for regular maintenance. There'll be asset management, both for hardware and software. There'll be configuration management and a CMDB. There'll be reporting and so on. There'll be event. You can see the list goes on quite a bit. And, and just getting those done where you've got SLAs or not, in some cases where you're talking about supporting clients that are outside the organization, there'll be a contract potentially with penalties sat behind it. All of that's very time consuming. And um, I've been engaged by a couple of organizations to say, how do we break this cycle, Mark? How do we get from doing all of this to a point where we've got fewer incidents, we've got more successful change, we're on top of our asset and configuration? Um, and, and the answer could be well, run a project, and, and that's an answer. But some of the other answers sit on the proactive side. So they sit on, on looking at things like problem management, looking at trends and saying, what could we do before we see an incident in that space, which hasn't happened yet, but, but we, we think based on information from monitoring tools and so on could happen. Um, in, terms of, in terms of service level management and availability, it's not just about setting an SLA and saying a service will be available 99.2% of the time. 
It's about saying, what can we do to make sure that's the case? What can we do to beat that, before, that, that availability? And I have seen a person who has done availability management very well, only one person in one organization. Um, and effectively, he'd do a proactive review of a system and a service end to end. He would identify single points of failure and the number of things that could be improved, the degree actions from that. And over time, it did materially improve the availability of that service by just taking a look at each service in detail and saying, how could we improve the availability of it? It's not something that many organizations do um, proactively. They tend to be after a series of major issues or incidents. Um, you've obviously got service continuity, looking at disaster recovery tests and how service will continue if, if individual components or data centers or locations are lost. You need to obviously consider suppliers. Then we get into the interesting ones around, around engaging with the business and thinking about, about what services we need to offer in the future in terms of a portfolio, um, what demand might be coming in for them in terms of how the business is changing or the customers are changing and what they need, and then what we need to provide in terms of a service strategy. So wh where would our service management need to be um, in line with the, the business or the customer's line and vision over the next three to five years? Um, Underpinning all of that, and I deliberately show it separately, is continual service improvement. I think I mentioned earlier, I would, I would see each process owner having their own continual service improvement um, ideas and register for their individual processes. You would then do the same for tools, you would do the same for, for services, you would do the same for particular customers. You can pull that in together, together into one or more service improvement plan or program, and certainly where I've seen those have work effectively to get to a particular aim. Um, they work very well. So I'm, I'm a big advocate of continual service improvement and um, would, would always see organizations that do that well, um, being the ones that will get better customer feedback and, and improve service. Okay, I'll pause at that point for breath and questions um, before we move on. Yes, there's no uh, questions in the chat, but John Mills has also replied um, around the silos. So that's great. Thanks, John. Um, so, uh, to all of you, any questions that you want to ask uh, Mark verbally? Anything that you see on your screen that you want to delve into a bit more detail, something you're not sure of? Hi, uh, am I audible? Like you here? You are, oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, I did follow the Slack and I've, I've recorded the, <clears throat> the previous day session and I've gone through. So I just make sure, you know, I'm up to the pace when I'm attending the third day session. So I could see there are more reactive and proactive sessions to be added on the day three. They have, yes. Good spot. I, re I remembered some stuff. I wrote these fairly quickly on Monday and I remembered yeah. some stuff that I probably really ought to have mentioned. So this isn't a comprehensive list of, of reactive processes in Itil V3 and proactive processes. There are some things I originally included that weren't really processes. Um, so, you know, we talked on a session yesterday, I think, around risk management, which is not a specific process in ITIL terms, but is nonetheless something that, that, is, that, that, that would be good practice in organizations to look at in terms of service and IT. Thank you. Yeah, and um, so I'm not sure if you had a question as well there, Laiju, but um, if uh, from memory, I know that officially, I think it's either 27 or 28 processes, uh, official processes in ITOR v3. And in ITOR v4, there are 34, I believe, if I remember correctly, practices. So they've actually um, gone ahead and expanded some anyway. So for argument's sake, I don't remember off head, but risk management may be in ITIL 4 as a practice show process. Um, uh, so yeah, so there are obviously uh, more, but these, what Mark's shown here, are definitely the, the, the primary ones, right? The ones that most people use. And actually, as we probably all know, many organizations, uh, perhaps only use eight or nine processes officially actually, but they're doing all of this stuff across their organization, but recognizing yeah. maybe eight or nine core processes um, with different levels of maturity. But yeah, so any, anyone else, any questions uh, for Mark on any of these and you know, best practices around them perhaps, or if you're having a particular issue with one, uh, anything that you want to delve in deeper? Now, uh, yeah. Uh, the current projects we we are dealing with, we have we have an application support section department, yep. and we also have an infrastructure section. Both are siloed, di different section. Now, <clears throat> the applications runs on the infrastructure provided by the other team. So ideally, there should be a handshaking and you know uh, unique yep. uh, uh, communication is ha happening. 
However, the, the infrastructure team, they follow a standard ITSM based process, the, the normal ITSM things. Wherein the application team, they are more of agile with DevOps approach. So mm -hmm. they are on a continuous delivery. They go with the different waves, releases, which is not aligning with the normal uh, ITSM change management, for example, wherein yeah. the, the infra team says, okay, any high risk changes should have a cab. But uh, but but the the app releases they go not then the app releases will not go on a single flow, they go on different waves, different streams. So each stream, it's it's practically not possible to have, uh, you know, different cap session for each stream because it's continuous application delivery which these guys are doing it. Well, yeah, so it's 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 a great question, and and this is one of the areas where where and I don't I probably haven't said this enough in the previous in the previous sessions is is where Itil says adopt and adapt. There isn't a Itil standard that you just take off the shelf and plug in and works everywhere. It's a question of looking at what Itil says as good practice and guidance and taking it as adopt and adapt. Um, I've, I've worked in similar organizations where there is an infrastructure and application split. I worked in a bank where there was a, a operations team called run the bank and there were um, delivery, delivery teams that were changed the bank and a kind of wall between the two. So that, that tension between those two parts of the organization and the cycles they run on is, is familiar to me. Um, what I would say is, is that, is that the applications can't run without the infrastructure and the infrastructure there's no point having without the application. So those two parts of the organization need to recognize they absolutely need each other. Um, there are ways I found of adopting change management and cabs to make it work in something that's more than just, we will have one cab per week and unless you go there, you are not gonna get approval. So I've seen cabs run for particular areas. So it could be a networks cab, it could be an applications cab, it could be for a particular business area. I've seen cabs run when I was running a program to introduce a new, a new Windows um, version uh, across a public sector organization in the UK. Um, and that was generating a number of issues. So we wanted to get control over change. And rather than doing that in the main cab, we had a pre-cab specifically for issues that were coming up and just made sure those were ready to go. So I think those are examples of where rather than saying there is a fixed thou shalt come to weekly cab, there needs to be some middle ground between that fast pace in a DevOps world, an agile world, and the we will only change this once a week. There needs to be some middle ground. And if you've got a small senior management or somebody who takes a service management view across those two teams, that's the area that, that can try and find a way to bringing them together and, and making them understand they need to find a way of adopting and adapting and, and working together. And on this one, um, so we could easily on this subject talk for another hour or two, right? So great question, big area, lots of uh, different insights, different ways to tackle this. So I think this is exactly the kind of thing that you could uh, explore in a one-to-one -one meeting with Mark or some of the other mentors. So that's the only reason why I will move us on. But it's a great question. Okay, so Mark, I'd suggest move on to your next slide yep. and then obviously more questions will come up afterwards. Of course, perfect. Um, so one of the areas that I know many organizations struggle with, certainly in my experience, is, is what I'll call service introduction or service transition. It doesn't have a, a consistent name across organizations. Some people would call it operations acceptance. I've seen other flavors of that as well. It is, it is what I mean by projects delivering either a new service or a change to existing services into operations. And, and what I didn't put on the slide, but I think, I think most people are aware of, is there is a different cadence and mindset between a project which is here to do a certain amount of work for a particular customer by a certain time in a certain budget, and operations, which just wants to make sure that things are running and, and that they can manage them on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that different mindset and culture means inevitably there are different tensions and pulls between the two. Um, why, why do I think people don't do this well and what could they do about it? Well, I think, I think it can be engaging too late so you know it is never too early for a project or somebody thinking about a project to start engaging and thinking about service and support what will it take for service and support teams to, to run this to maintain it to feed and water it to patch it disaster recovery test continuity and so on the whole thing what would it take to actually operate this as a service and I think some of the projects I've seen are about implementing 
particular infrastructure or particular applications or a combination of the two. And what they haven't thought about is that they are effectively delivering a service that will run for three, five, ten, however many years it will be. And they need to put the infrastructure and the framework in place to be able to make that happen. So I think it's never too early for a project to engage and to start having that broader thinking. But rather than thinking about specific technical deliveries, it's about thinking about what it will take to manage that as a service. Um, so as you can tell, it's an area that I could talk about for some time, um, having, having had the numerous examples. But I would say that whilst I've got a number of examples where projects didn't do that thinking and where programs didn't, have, didn't engage early enough, I have got a fairly large number of examples where projects and programs were wanting to engage. And actually, service and support team said, I'm too busy, I haven't got time, you're a project, and my, my focus is operations. And they kept pushing it down the road. Um, and then you get to... Like, week a week maybe before go live suddenly the service team would say i'm not ready and a project that wanted to work with them and had budget and time to do so then has to say well if you're not ready that puts us in an awkward position so there is a need on both sides to recognize that projects have to engage early and services support teams need to find a way of freeing up some bandwidth and having that discussion and being 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 able to share what do they need to have in place um so how, how do you how do you unblock this well, many people work with a service checklist. So it'll be a service introduction or service transition checklist. Again, it can usually start small by saying what are the things that are needed. Um, it, it then tends to grow, and I, I've seen it grow into, into larger and larger documents. Um, I've seen checklists that effectively say, here are the things that are needed, and they then align those to individual gates. So this is what's needed for a business case. This is what's needed for a project initiation in the project initiation document or PID. This is what we need to design. This is what we need to test. And as part of testing the service and the infrastructure and the applications, you should be testing the service management processes. Can service desk handle the calls? Is, is the CMDB up to date? Um, do, do you have a maintenance plan in place? Can you do disaster recovery? One of my real bugbears with projects is them kind of descoping things. Um, and, and if you need to have a disaster recovery test because a service is critical, then the project should be doing that rather than assuming that service and support teams will somehow find a way to do it once the thing is live. So I think there's a number of things that can be done there. Um, but I think that checklist and aligning it to the project gates is a good start. Um, that's where I'd start. Um, if you're doing that and want to find a way of, of moving beyond that because you've reached the limit, and I have seen organisations that have ended up with a service tra tra transition process and checklist, which is so big it becomes unwieldy and managing, uh, manageable, is you can start to think about a more design for service mindset. So, so you actually think about the fact, as I said earlier, that you're implementing a service here rather than specific infrastructure and applications. And so you're designing and thinking service all the way through. You are effectively building money and time in the business case. You're referencing it in the PID and so on. So you're thinking about implementing the service rather than I will put an application live or I will migrate service from one location to another. It's thinking about service all the way through. Um, and, and certainly that then means having service architects and service designers and others engaged, um, which again, those organizations that I see do this well have in place. So I'll pause at that point for, for breath and more questions. Yeah, so no questions in the chat, Mark, uh, but let's see if anyone has any that they want to verbally ask you. So any comments or questions around service introduction? Hi, uh, yes. I have also seen in one of our projects wherein it was more of related to internet connectivity service. Yep. So uh, wherein, the, wherein the service provider was more of keen to provide the internet connectivity, what they were least bothered whether the, connect, the internet was it usable or not usable. Yes. So it was always measured, okay, do you have a connectivity? Is the ping coming up? Uh, yes, then 100% met the SLA, but are you able to use that? Yeah, internet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah that was never measured and these guys were always reporting 100 percentage yeah so uh, this is this this uh, again I've, I've, it's not the first time i've heard of similar stories like that um this is where you know, i'm primarily talking about, about about engaging and thinking about service early on it is very easy to get obsessed with one individual metric and one individual measure of service like availability and 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 not think about well actually is it usable it's up but can i use it 
So that's where you need to think about what I'd call service level requirements. I've heard them called non-functional requirements before. They're not about, I want the product, I want this application to do X, or I want this application to do Y. It's about how it works, it's about how it performs. Um, so you'd include response figures, you'd, you'd, you'd include certain things that you wanted to be able to do that aren't functional, but actually prove that it's usable um, for the people that are consuming that service. And if, if you've got to a point where availability and it being up is the only thing that matters, then it's probably too late. But I have seen service level requirements gathered earlier, they're then incorporated in the design, they're then included in the test plan and proving. And by the time it goes live, it's about more than just availability. It's also got performance and service level agreements and monitoring in place. But it's absolutely clear that it's not just about whether it's up or down, it's about whether it's actually performant and usable. Yeah. Okay. And again, great question, great topic, could speak on it for hours, right? So again, another reason why you should definitely book some time with uh, Mark. But just because of that, uh, time, we have approximately 10 minutes left before the next session. I'll move us on. Yeah, cool. Um, so I was going to close by, by effectively covering what, what I think trends and challenges are for service management. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't produce this slide without thinking about where the world currently is. You know, we are in lockdown in, in the UK and in many countries. That means organisations that were used to working in offices um, are typically now got a remote workforce working from home. And that means that things that perhaps they'd built around lands and WANs and so on that were office based. Now other things are important. I and mean, I was working with a law firm. Um, where they had a list of critical systems that were all office-based and within two weeks that list of systems grew because remote connectivity and the ability for lawyers and others to work from home suddenly became very important so you know, being able to respond quickly to that doing impossible things very quickly around making those critical services and providing providing more detailed support to people that are outside of an office that that's that's where a lot of organizations are and just settling down from that has taken some time um, i mentioned evergreen technologies because um, I can remember a time, and, and certainly been involved in projects and programs, we were rolling out a version of Windows, could have been XP, um, could have been 7, could have been 8, could have been 10. Now we're on Windows 10, then that's the last version of Windows that Microsoft will produce. Um, but every six months, there's a new feature release, and so you've got around 18 months life of that feature release and to migrate all of your users off to a future one. And at that point, it goes into support. So ironically now, Windows 8.1 is supported for longer than many of the, the older versions of Windows 10, which have reached their end of support with Microsoft at this point. And you'll find the same, not just with Microsoft, you'll find the same with ServiceNow. Many people's ServiceNow contract says N minus one, so it will report the current release and the previous release. ServiceNow releases are every six months, so every year at least you're gonna to have to factor in an upgrade and testing and so on around that ServiceNow piece. Same will apply to iOS, the same will apply to Android. So this isn't patching, this is regular feature releases coming in that you need to manage and control your way through. And that's where having a good roadmap around where they look like, having good engagement with those suppliers, some of which are great at sharing their roadmap. Others, I won't name names, and but happy to talk about them offline, are nowhere near as good at sharing that. Um, that's something that organizations need to be on top of and is a challenge for service management. Um, cloud services, it's nothing new. Um, in, in fact, in many respects, many organizations are already there in terms of the cloud, and, and the cloud is effectively hosting stuff in somebody else's data center. Um, so organizations have been doing that to an extent in, in different ways. What's different around cloud is that is that you can ramp those up or down, and, and the level of, of knowing, knowing what that supplier is doing is very different through those cloud-based services and contracts, and, and that's where you need to have a different mindset and approach particularly if you're using more than one cloud vendor to pull a service together for an organization that, that I have seen being a challenge. Um, and I think we talked a bit about Agile and DevOps and the need to manage that. Um, my glass tends to be a bit more half, half full. Um, and so we talked about some of the challenges of, of kind of aligning a more traditional, we'll have a weekly cab and, and an Agile and, 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 and mindset and so on. But I do think we have historically had problems where projects have implemented something as a pilot or a prototype and then we found that actually that has suddenly gone live and people are using it and it hasn't got a service defined or managed around it. I think Agile gives us an opportunity to say that that service is live early, therefore it needs to be implemented. So I think there are opportunities there and, and, uh, and I think there's a way of managing that, but it does require more, more thinking and work around how Agile is going to work. And I know that there are some things in Itil V4 which are going to help around better integration with DevOps and, and Agile. 
Great, thank you, Mark. So we have about five minutes uh, to cover any other questions or comments that you have. So Marcos, uh, Mohamed, uh, Aneke, anything that you're unsure of? And deliberate, I left Laiju out because I know he might have a great question and he's already spoken, but I'm um, <laughs> looking to uh, get you, the other guys, uh, to ask anything that's on your mind. Um, well, I, I've got no question at the moment, like I said earlier on. I'm new to this, so I'm, all I know is um, I'm going to be exploring a bit more with the service management understanding, um, with, you know, self study. But yeah. obviously, um, if you guys can be available maybe via email or something like that, where if I've got questions, because I'm sure I will have loads of questions yeah. um, going into the journey. So yeah. that's just from my end. I just don't want to come across as a bit too. Uh, no, you're <laughs> no, not. No, no. And, and, and okay, um, use the Slack channel, yeah? Uh, yeah the yeah. Slack channel is so good yeah. for this. Um, so I rather had, an email, go and book time yeah. with the mentors, uh, ask questions in the Slack channel, absolutely. It's been fascinating running these sessions because it always triggers thoughts in my mind. And I think one of the one of the things we could do in Slack is to have, have a more dedicated service management channel that would effectively enable us to, to ask and answer. Oh, sorry, how do I access that Slack channel? Because I'm not... I'm not if you're not a member, I'm, so many people are. Just them, um, Anike, you've already emailed me. You've got my email. Just send me an email saying, uh, what's the link for the Slack channel? And I'll reply to you and provide it. Okay, Perfect. Um, and Thanks, same to Alex. any of you, you know, if you're not sure where that is, just email me, you've all got my email and, I, and I'll send it to you. Um, uh, Mark, there is one more question that's coming, which sure. we'll cover and then we'll have to end. And it's a question for Marcos. Um, how is the service management in terms of cloud transition from on-premise networks? So the link between, you know, on-prem and cloud and what your view there is, and then uh, how service management is wrapped around, you know, cloud show. I, I've got to be honest, my answer is going to be contracts, contracts, contracts. It, it is really important to understand what, what, you, what you need from that cloud provider because there are things that you previously had control of within your own data centers and with your own support teams that you are now going to be completely dependent on a third party cloud supplier. And, and that could be a public cloud where effectively you're, provided, you're using a service that that supplier uh, and that cloud cloud provider manage, manages for lots of organizations. So being clear on what you need, making sure that you've been included that as part of the requirements and that you've got it in a contract. You know, getting those requirements and getting those contracts clear up front are vital. I was doing some work a few years ago designing a service on the early introduction of Office 365 and a law firm, and they hadn't realized that Microsoft could effectively take the service down and patch it at, at any particular point because it was in the fine detail of the Microsoft service agreement. So. You know, I, I will I will emphasize contracts a number of times and say understand that that provider is going to be doing things for you that you currently have control of and, and think about how that's going to work. And that, that by that I don't just mean individual actions, it's the whole of the ITIL gamut from how is their change management going to work, how's incident going to work, how's problem going to work. It's thinking about it in the round and you know the more time you spend getting your own internal experts to think about what that transition would look like and how it needs to be operated and fed and watered and managed and scaled up and projects landed on it, the better. You know, spend more time in initiation planning and less time trying to get the first service over. Be absolutely my boss. Yeah. And I'll just add one thing and then, then you know, we'll wrap up. Um, so completely agree, Mark. I think where um, services were on-prem internally and that you had control, just like you were saying, more emphasis was being given on the service operations life cycle of processes so incident problem change you still need those of course but with more of a shift towards cloud uh, more focus needs to be given to those other life cycle areas of strategy design and transition transition to the supplier and mm -hmm. um, still operations of course but far more emphasis on those other areas that for many 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 years hadn't really been given from many organizations the time that they needed. So yeah, great question. Um, I hope you've all found it beneficial. Thank you very much, Mark. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Email me if you're not on the Slack channel so I can send you the link. Uh, and as I said, reach out to Mark for one-to-one -one time with him as well as ask any questions uh, in the Slack channel. I hope you all appreciated it. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Thank John, as well. No problems, guys. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you.